would like to welcome Leo Simonovich. He is the Vice President and Global Head of Industrial Cyber and Digital Security for Siemens Energy. He's responsible for the strategic direction for Siemens Industrial Cyber Security business worldwide, focused on solving the cybersecurity challenge in the oil and gas market and power sectors by bringing unique solutions that address growing and costly operational security risk. Previously, Leo led the cyber risk analytics practice area at Booz Allen Hamilton. He refined his ex expertise through his work with large government and commercial customers to improve their cyber risk posture. While at Booz, Leo created an industrial, I'm sorry, an industry recognized methodology to evaluate the financial benefits of investment in cybersecurity. Thank you. Um, so digitalization. Um, it offers enormous promise, and yet cybersecurity or cyber attacks have eroded our trust in digital. Um, they've prevented us from taking advantage of digitalization, and at the same time, they've prevented us from taking action on security. On the OT side, if you look at just a basic proxy metric for how long a piece of malware sits on an industrial network versus an IT network, it's almost double. And so the question is, how do we overcome that confidence gap? I would argue that digitalization and cybersecurity can, are interchangeable, and that the data that we collect from our traditional assets can be used as an indicator of a potential cyber compromise. So with that, what I want to do is three things. One is tell you a little bit about how we see the industry and its readiness levels. Second, how we think about the cybersecurity journey um, for ourselves at Siemens and how we've helped customers around this. And then lastly, talk a little bit about some of the solutions um, that are really foundational to building that trust and taking the necessary steps. You gotta crawl before you can walk, and you'll hear that as, as the theme of my presentation. So with that, let's start with industrial cyber. I don't need to tell this room that the cyber threat for OT is real. What's surprising, though, is how quickly and how potent it's become. So now, industrial cyber risk compromise, um, either things that are originating on the OT side or targeting the OT side, comprise 30% of all attacks. We partnered up with the Ponyman Institute to look at the readiness levels. And what's surprising, or is, is how much of a concern it's become. So something like 20% of all companies are experiencing 10 attacks or more in the industrial space. OT security has become a greater concern than the IT side. And yet, most of the industry today is not prepared. You guys rate yourselves as being either in the low or medium stage of maturity, struggling with fundamentals, unpatched assets, lack of trained personnel, and an ability to monitor. So why is this so complex? Well, I think this picture illustrates it nicely. To take advantage of digitalization, you have to have indiscriminate trust. The ability to add and subtract devices. The ability of data to travel across networks. And real-time connectivity where it makes sense. To take advantage of that, you have to secure the field, the control room, and the enterprise network. And you got to do it all the way down to layer one. That's really challenging as a problem to solve especially a problem at the edge where a lot of the intelligence 
is being pushed today. So, what are some of the solutions? Well, analytics, you tell us, offers enormous promise to short circuit this challenge. Why? Because um, when in a world where the probability of an attack being successful is 100%, and an organization experiencing at least one attack a year, detection is the name of the game. But you cannot protect what you cannot see. And so, why are more companies taking advantage of digitalization? Why are more companies taking advantage of analytics? They want to, but I would have ventured to say is they don't know how to get started. And, where, and what it boils down to is lack of people in most organizations, especially for mid-sized enterprises, lack of strategy Right? And most importantly, lack of an operating model to address this. So the way that I think about it is in building blocks. And you've got to get started somewhere to take advantage of it. Now, there are some inherent challenges in um, applying analytics. Lack of standard protocols, digital and legacy assets, some legacy assets that are 50 years old or more, right? So, um, and, and you don't know when you deploy a security solution, even a simple one, like a patch, how the plant is going to react. The other big challenge is that data today doesn't sit in one place. It is both an organizational challenge and a data integrity challenge. So what you'll see is that a lot of the data that we would consider to be essential as an ingredient to doing detection will sit with folks that do production, we'll, some of it will sit with IT, and some of it is not being tracked at all. And without this data being aggregated in one place, to do analytics on it, it's very hard to get at detection. And so, how do we begin to address this? Well, I think the Ukraine example um, is a nice illustration of what happens if you don't collect all your data and think about, um, and, and think about how it interacts with one another. In Ukraine, the operator for the first four hours didn't know that he was experiencing a cyber attack. He thought his DCS was malfunctioning, right? And only when it all began to go south, right, did he realize that he had to switch to manual. The result, 225,000 homes lost their power in the middle of winter for two weeks. This is the magic formula to get a detection. And also the building blocks that, when it comes to analytics, um, we need to put together. Asset data, think of it as a turbine, a compressor, control level data, all the way down to the sensor, plus network data, combined together to do analytics. And the question is, do I start here, here, or here? There's no right answer. It's a journey. And many of you may have started with the network piece. And I know there's been a lot of talk about network visibility, and that's really important. There's also, and if you talk to Eddie, he'll tell you this, there's so many other assets that don't have an IP address, and yet could, from a consequent perspective, could bring, down a, uh, could bring down a plant. We would know, because we were affected as Siemens by Stuxnet. So we're a little bit early to this journey. Our, our friends at, at Schneider are, are experiencing and living a lot of this now. So getting down to this layer is key, but also thinking about 
the other pieces, vulnerability management, configuration management, those are all indicators that would tell you whether you're experiencing a compromise or not. And so let's talk about the first step in all of this, um, and that is getting an inventory of your, your assets. Well, what's interesting is that the um, definition of an asset has really changed. It's no longer just about the endpoint or an HMI. It's about three things. It's about data. That's an asset. It has value attached to it. And it's also about people. General Hayden talked about the target attack. Well, that's about supply chain risk. And it's also about that individual coming into a site, plugging in, and so knowing who that person is, how they behave, what is normal about their behavior, is a key ingredient. And so transient assets, right, has become sort of the next stage of, um, of understanding what you have. And so looking at people, looking at assets, and looking at data, and doing it across all of your operations, because some of those things may be stationary or they may go from zone to zone to zone. From there, the question is, well, if you combine, once you know what you have, once you know how it's behaving, then it's a question of, well, how do I and this is where a lot of the industry, I think, struggles with applying analytics, is how to bring it all together. How to, un to, to understand whether a, a particular PLC right, is integral to process or not. And going back to the title of my presentation, around two sides of the same coin, that PLC right, could not just be integral to production, but also to security. And so where all of this starts is with determining what is important to your business. When we think about detection, we don't actually start with applying AI and machine learning. It's very important to do that. And we'll talk about that in, in a second. But um, the way that we did it at Siemens is we said, why don't we start with the business. And we ask them, what is important to you? We call those the golden nuggets. And it's amazing what we thought was important versus what they thought was important. And the disconnect between the two was a conversation that we had to bridge. Once we know what's a priority, we have to figure out how to protect it. And only then can you begin to figure out how to build connectivity incrementally. We shouldn't be afraid of connectivity. Why? For the simple fact that 75% of all attacks on the OT side happen because of insider threat. So you think you're air-gapped and you think you're safe? You're not. And in fact, visibility is what gives you the power and the insights to react. So the discovery and the detection, that when it's done smartly, can give you that visibility. But then you actually have to figure out what this means. So not just detecting the anomaly, but putting the anomaly in context. And from there, developing an appropriate response plan. What's interesting, and uh, I've talked to some of you about this, is that there's an enormous amount of false positives. Just a ton of noise. And getting beyond the noise is really important. Um, the, to go beyond the noise requires time. It requires advanced technology. I think AI and machine learning not, uh, especially when it's unsupervised, offers enormous promise. 
because it tells you what's normal and what's not normal. And then the variance and the volatility around it is one indicator of the consequence of a potential piece of malware being on your network or in your control system. But then from there, more important than detection is what are you actually going to do about it? What are you going to do about it from a vulnerability perspective, knowing what you have and how it matches up against vulnerabilities? But also knowing how to respond. And oftentimes, in, at the, especially at the plant level, um, we are ready for the average thing when it comes to cyber, but we're not ready for the mega attack like WannaCry, for instance. Why? Because when we train, we train for hygiene. But we don't train necessarily for the, for the catastrophic attack. And somehow, we have to take a lot of this thinking in the world where there's just these mega attacks happen, it seems, every, every couple of months. That's really important. And so training against that and then reacting when appropriate against the things that you spot is really key. So, um, and I would love to take your questions um, around this. So, um, just to summarize, uh, analytics offers enormous promise. A lot of the data that you already collect today for, for, to run your plants is actually valuable. That's one piece of the equation. Right? Aggregating that data in a central place, developing analytics around it that are meaningful is really important. Not being afraid of connectivity to do so is absolutely essential. And then from there, knowing how to react against that, whatever it is that you find. Okay, so I, I know I just breezed through this pretty quickly. I'm happy to open up to questions and really get into a, into a conversation. You talk a lot about analytics. What what type of analytics are different things that you're using today with, with Siemens? Um, within Siemens. So um, so to me analytics is a big broad area, and it means many things to many different people. Analytics, when we talk about security, really relates to those three blocks that I, that I mentioned. Network data plus asset data plus control level data gives you that detection in the OT space. So at Siemens, um, what we've done is we've connected our plants using those three variables. After all, um, a turbine malfunctioning could be an indicator of compromise, right? Especially when you correlate it against network data and it tells you something else, right? So around the world, maybe we, we maybe have 250, 300 production facilities, if you not count the service shops. Um, we are on a journey to connect many of those. Not all of them, because they may not be as critical. It's all about prioritization to apply these kinds of analytics. Other questions? Oh, sorry. Hey, you, you, uh, you made a couple of comments, and I'd like you to flesh them out a bit, if you would. Um, can you talk a little bit about the intelligence that Siemens brings to the mix? I mean, you've got this platform that you painted out here, um, and I think everyone kind of gets that, but what's the high level intelligence that Siemens brings to the mix of the technology that you're putting on the table. Um, your experience, uh, you know, running some of the largest installations in the world, et cetera, and the history of Siemens, bringing that intelligence to bear for people in the room. Yeah, so we, we have, uh, by the latest count, something like 60% of the world's install base. Um, so 
um, in, installed in a lot of your plants, but also in mobility, in healthcare. And attacks on the OT side oftentimes know no boundaries. Um, and so the key, um, and this has been uh, our experience, is to get context. So over the last five years, we, we worked on process security analytics to combine these data, different data streams um, together and to be able to detect but more importantly than detect is to provide context. Um, and the way that we think about it is very quickly, it's once you've detected something, where does this asset sit in the production process? How does it interact with other assets? Um, and then ultimately, if it was to go down, sort of doing the what if scenario around it, we'll tell you whether it matters or not. Being able to do that in real time, right? We, we're, we've done that for many of our customers and of course for ourselves. Other questions? So have y'all thought any about addressing, you know, in a steady state process, you know, it seems like a lot of this stuff could work well, but even, you know, we've looked at batch processes that we have a lot of over the years and we've known for a long time that human behavior is sort of times a factor in quality of product just depending on how styles of how they interact with the system but how do you begin to address something like that when you're looking at something that's not a steady state process and you're changing out different products and different times of the year and there's a lot of variability because it makes a whole lot more noise to try and make sense out of so go done anything like that with the batch related process um, yes uh, um, and we've done it also not just with process um, but we've also done it um, with uh, assets on the on the power side. Um, as if you think about distributed grid and um, demand response, uh, there's a lot of volatility in that. So the key to that is having a self-learning system um, that's unsupervised. And this is where AI machine learning offers just enormous amount of pro promise. Um, we're never going to be the best AI and machine learning company in the world, so we, we partnered with, uh, with Darktrace um, to help provide that, that learning. And um, it happens in real time um, to, to figure out what's normal. And that oftentimes changes. It, has to, it changes um, linearly when you add an asset to a network or when you take a batch and you introduce it into the process uh, or when you're doing, for instance, 3D printing, for example, which we are doing quite a bit of now to, um, to do asset maintenance, right? We're literally printing blades uh, on customer sites and when, or parts to, um, uh, to help work in our, with our motors and drives. So this is where I think AI is just, is absolutely the right tool to apply. Hey, Leo, <clears throat> this is John Moretta with Parsons. Um, Question for you, when you're supplying equipment, whether you're supplying a, let's say, a, a turbine or a compressor or something like that, are you pre-building in any sort of systems or, or um, sensors or things that will have it ready to go? Uh, or are you ha having to look at the whole system holistically to protect um, the asset? We're starting to. It takes a village um, to do this. So we also have to look at our supply chain. Um, and uh, every one of our product lines now has a product security officer that looks at it holistically uh, from inception all the way through disposal um, and then builds in um, the, the kinds of connectors and collectors that will allow us to, we don't do it on every product line. Um, and obviously for us, it's a, it used to be a business decision, but now we see this as being an imperative. Um, and I'll actually take your question as an opportunity to talk about um, the, the Charter of Trust, which um, you saw the, probably saw the principles out there as you were walking in. Um, this is our global initiative um, that basically says that we as an industry need to come together. This is, needs to be peer-led. There's 10 principles, and one of them is the responsibility for the digital value chain. Um, and 
what we'll do is, as we build out the charter, which basically says there's a minimum viable set of standards that all of our vendors have to comply to. We're just starting this journey. I think it was announced at the Munich Security Conference a few months ago. But eventually, we'll get to a point where we need to build a trusted community where, uh, whereby we raise the level of maturity, um, not just for, for ourselves, but also for our, for, for our vendors.